I've got to make this quick. I'm going to tell you a story before it's too late. So, two weeks ago, after our factory converted over to producing only toilet paper, half of my co-workers were sick. In light of the COVID-19 pandemic, the factory shut down and all employees were ordered to be tested. After all tests came back negative, all of us who were healthy enough to do so returned to the production floor. Now I worked with three other guys at the shipping end of the line. We packed the product, stacked it on pallets, wrapped it in plastic, and we moved it into the loading bays. You know, our normal 8-hour graveyard shift had been changed to 12-hour shifts because so many people were out sick. And honestly, well, none of us minded. We were just trying to do our part to help during a worldwide health crisis. It didn't hurt that we were being paid a lot of overtime either. More and more employees got sick though. They had flu-like symptoms. But every test for any kind of flu came back negative. One guy was diagnosed with strep, but nobody had the flu. I was really confused by all the sickness. It made me wonder if the virus had somehow morphed into something undetectable. I began wearing a mask and gloves to work even though I wasn't in a large group of people. Hell, I worked a good 30 feet from the other guys back there, but... I didn't want to keep testing fate. The guys called me hazmat, gave me all sorts of hell over my getup, but I didn't care. Now late in the week, a co-worker told us that one of the first people to get sick had recovered completely from the sickness, but was having hallucinations and got stuck in a mental hospital for tests and observation. But that weekend, we heard a dozen more had suffered mental breaks and were in hospitals across three counties. Now to me, one person going nuts was just shitty luck. Maybe his fever was too high for too long and did some damage or something. But 13 in just a few days? No, that was more than bad luck. Now, I'd be lying if I said I didn't consider quitting my job then. Because I did think about it. I was working six days a week, 12 hours a night. Now, I wasn't married, but I was doing all I could to help out my mother who had been laid off due to the outbreak. She had hardly any savings, as she had helped me after a really bad car wreck left me bedridden and unable to work for a few months last year. If I quit my job, we would both be up the old proverbial creek without a paddle inside two weeks. I spent my Sunday off dwelling on what might have caused the sickness at my workplace. I knew a lot of the people there. Not like they were friends or anything, though. They were just faces with names. Who I passed on a daily basis as we clocked in or out. Day shifts suffered a lot less than night shift. And that had me baffled, too. I mean, we all did the same jobs, just at different times of the day. We all handled the same materials, stood at the same machines, sat in the same break rooms. That's when it hit me. We didn't all handle the same materials. Not exactly. Uh, the base material we use in the production of any of our paper products come from one company. Or rather, it did until we revamped the factory and ramped up our production to almost double what we thought we could do before. That's when we started taking really cheap shipments of cellulose, better known as pulp, from a company I'd never heard of. Our storage inside the plant was full of the regular cellulose. The new would be brought in by semi-trucks, who dropped the entire trailer in our lot, hooked up the empty one and left. It was not common practice for sure, so my shift was using different cellulose. I hadn't thought about it before, but really, how different could it be? The results had been the same. The quality of the finished product had remained the same. Making a mental note of where the sick people worked in the factory, 
I realized the largest portion of them had worked in or near the intake side. And that's the exact opposite side from where I worked. The unlucky 13 who had been hospitalized all worked directly with shipments of the new cellulose, so it had to be connected. When I brought up my theory to my boss, he laughed me out of his office. I thought it meant to be derisive, but the way he kept fidgeting and his eyes kept darting around, it was more of a nervous laugh. He told me to keep my stupid theories to myself, that he didn't need a factory full of panicked employees rioting over the new materials. The new cellulose was necessary, but I was not. He also informed me as he closed the door in my face. On first break, we were told three more men at the intake side had fallen sick, just like the others, and were sent home. On our lunch break, the supervisor came in to let us all know we would be shifted around on the floor the following day, so the place could function with a bare-bones crew. We would earn $3 more on the hour if we could keep production up to 85% of what it had been, and $4 if we could keep it above 95%. While the others whooped and pumped their fists in the air like they'd won the lottery, I sat in the corner with my gloves and mask, watching the supervisor's every move. He nodded at the reaction, he seemed satisfied, and he left. I'd seen no nervous tick or anything like I had with the boss to indicate he knew anything more than we did about the situation. Now to say the least... I wasn't happy with my new assignment at the other end of the production line. I was too close to the new cellulose in the intake bays where the guys used pallet jacks to cart in the loads from the truck as we needed them. I could see the bay from my station. As two pallets were being pulled inside, I saw something small and dark drop to the concrete floor, and scurry behind a machine. It was the size of a chipmunk. It was faster, though. I moved away from my station a few steps, trying to see where the critter went. But I didn't see it anywhere. Thinking it probably ran back outside, scared off by the deafening noise inside the plant. I went back to work and put the incident out of my mind. It wasn't unusual for small animals to find their way into the place, None ever stayed more than a second or two because of the racket of the machinery. The guy pulling that cart was sick by lunchtime. And just before our next break, I saw two more of those weird animals scuttle off into the shadows of machinery. They had both jumped from one pallet. I flagged down the man pulling the cart and told him what I had seen. Then I told him the guy who left sick had also carried one of the critters in on his pallet earlier. He had listened, seemingly interested, until then. His brow furrowed and he called me a psycho conspiracy theorist out to cause panic in the factory, and if I didn't stop sprouting nonsense, he would gladly make it so I would have to eat through a straw for a few weeks. Everybody was stressed. Yeah, I got that. Hell, you know, I was stressed too. But I didn't go around pissed off all the time like that guy and my boss and some of the others. He unloaded the pulp and returned the pallet jack. I watched him more than my station, determined to figure out what those things were and how they were making the workers sick. As he returned the jack, I stepped away and watched him closely. He sat on one of the empty truck bays and lit a cigarette. I didn't care that he was breaking the company rule about not smoking, but the tiny dark creature easing toward him interested me a lot. No chipmunk would sneak up on someone. I moved closer, standing behind a wide column and peering out at the scene. The animal was black and had gray stripes like a tiger. It had no tail and its ears laid close to its head. I was intrigued. And hey, the guy had been a real asshole to me, so I wasn't really concerned about his fate. I mean, the thing was tiny, 
how much harm could it inflict? And yet, there was a part of me hoping the thing would at least scare the hell out of the guy. It would serve him right for being such a jerk and not listening. Now this creature took its time, looking carefully around before each step. I glanced back at my station. Everything was good for a few minutes. Then I looked back. The creature had been joined by a second one. When they were about ten feet from the guy's back, they looked at each other and stood on their back feet. Facing each other, they seemed to communicate with hand and head gestures. It was horrifying and fascinating all at once. Those things could even walk upright like a man. My jaw dropped. The mean kid in me that wanted to let the guy get whatever was coming to him relented and the adult me took over. I darted toward them, waving my hands in the air and screaming for the man to turn around before it was too late. But he couldn't hear me over the noisy machines, and he still had his earplugs in to boot. The animal saw me, dropped to all fours, and ran the last few feet to the man's back. One darted to the side close to his arm and leapt from the building. His head jerked as he saw the movement. Then he started to stand up, placing one bare hand on the floor beside him. The other creature ran across this hand so fast, it was only a blur. It then followed the first one's route, escaping into the darkness beyond the streetlight. Now I reached the man as he finished standing and turned to glare at me. I looked to his hand. He looked down and then held it up staring in disgust at the long, thin rope of snotty-looking stuff hanging from it. Flinging his hand down to his side, he swiped it hard back and forth on his jeans. And backing away, I held up both hands toward him. Dude, stop, what the hell are those things? I nodded as if placating a child on the verge of a tantrum. You need to go to the emergency room and tell them to check you for... I stopped check for what? I didn't even know what he should tell them. It didn't matter, though. He shook his head. Check for what, Hazmat? So a squirrel sneezed on my hand. It's not the end of the world. He tossed the cigarette out and walked away, shaking his hand as if it had been injured. He cradled it against his chest and shot a sour look over his shoulder at me before going into the bathroom. I hoped he was going to wash that hand. He was deluded if he had really thought those things were squirrels. The alarm on my sheen blared to life, sending me back to change out the huge roll of paper. Now at quitting time, I scanned the bays for the man but didn't see him anywhere. It was my guess he had taken ill and left early. Somehow those creatures were making people sick. I was certain of it. Before clocking out, I headed to the bathroom. I found the guy. He was face down in the middle of the floor, with his feet still in a stall as if he had been walking out when he fell. Now at first, I thought he was lying in a pool of oil. That somehow it had been spilled there and he had slipped in it. After the initial knee-jerk reaction to seeing a person lying on the floor, motionless, I snapped out of it and moved closer. His right hand was gone. Not like cut off, but rather like it had dissolved all the way to his wrist. Black bile bubbled slowly from the stump as I gawked. And then there was a slight hissing noise, and the skin of his forearm collapsed as more black shit flooded out, widening a circle of muck on the floor. Squawking in horror, I stood up and backed away. The official report said he had come in contact with an unknown chemical that had a caustic effect. The hell, I knew better. I tried to tell them what really happened. And for my troubles, I spent 71 hours locked up in the mental hospital for evaluation. One of my other co-workers, Ben 
who had been locked in there for over two weeks, found me in the common room. He looked like death warmed over, black under his eyes, yellowing and broken teeth, splotchy gray toned skin stretched over his face, a thinning wild hair, and a thick wrapping around one of his hands. He told me it was a chemical burn. The doctors thought he had come in contact with a chemical. And yep, you guessed it, it had a caustic effect on his skin. He said the worse the erosion of his skin got, the worse the nightmares and visions became. The doctors also blamed this on exposure to an unknown chemical. He said it was the black fairies of the forest who caused it. He had seen one in the pulp truck, but it was so quick he dismissed it as his eyes playing tricks on him in the dark. The black fairies, in his story, were the forest protectors and aren't evil. They only do what they must to protect their home. Their saliva is fatal and one bite could kill a man within an hour. A scratch can be fatal, but usually only sickens the victim. If they expel breath in a man's face, they'll go insane. Ben thought the others had been scratched and inhaled the breath of madness. Now, it all seems ridiculous. Maybe he was crazy, but maybe he was right, though. You know, I was open to any explanation by that point, but refrained from showing any kind of enthusiasm for fear of being kept there past the 71 hours I was already in for. And I started to walk away. But Ben grabbed my arm at my elbow, stopping me. Don't go back to work. They're in the pulp trucks. I'm not crazy. Pulling my arm away, I nodded and left. I scrubbed my arm with soap for a solid five minutes, leaving a wide, angry red band on it. I got out with a new mission, to find out all I could about black fairies of the forest. I'd never heard of them, and as I said, I was open to any explanation at that point. It's been a few days and I've had little luck searching out answers online, at least for here in the US. Now I don't think I have much time left to make sense of this all. The skin has begun to peel off my arm where Ben grabbed me. I kept telling myself it's only because I've used bleach to wash it off every day, but I can't be sure. I keep hearing scuttling noises and chitterings of an unknown language, and I'm sure I just saw a tree take a step to the right in my yard. It grinned at me. I don't know what that means when a tree grins at you, but it did. Personally, I don't think I'm going crazy. But the bird at my window disagrees. He says I'm certified batshit. <laughs>